If you give two athletes the exact same training program and they both put in 100% effort, their results will not be identical. This is a simple truth that most people recognise, but it raises some interesting questions. To what extent is our physical destiny set? Is there any point in training for skills and traits that don't come naturally? What are the mechanisms of these genetic limitations and advantages? How do we maximise our genetic gifts and minimise the impact of our weaknesses? While many things are up for discussion when it comes to your physical makeup, something that is non-negotiable is an individual's physical dimensions, that is to say, the proportionate length of limbs, overall height and insertions. Limb proportion is a subject that has been gaining more recognition among coaches, particularly as it pertains to movements like the squat. The simple truth is there is no one correct way to squat. Ankle and hip mobility play a big role and some of this is genetically predetermined. For example, a lifter with a longer femur, thigh bone, versus tibia, shin bone, will need to lean forward more into the squat. We can gain more ankle mobility, but we sure can't get longer tibias short of some painful, years-long surgery. Just to be clear, I am not recommending that surgery. Then there's hip socket depth. If you have a shallow hip socket and thick femoral neck, then you will experience a reduced range of motion. Other factors play a role too, like the femoral neck angle, which refers to the way the top of the thigh bone angles. Likewise, the comparative length of your arms compared with your legs is of course going to impact on the way you deadlift. This is why we shouldn't judge the squat technique of others without having trained them directly. Nor should we dogmatically force ourselves to adhere to impossible standards from coaches that have never met us in person. Of course, limb length also impacts on the distance that a weight needs to be moved. Squatting a weight at 6 foot 8 inches involves moving it a greater distance than squatting it at 4 foot 8. Limb length also works alongside tendon insertions, which we'll get to in a moment. Of course, the length of your limb also limits the amount of muscle you can fit into a smaller space. Likewise, the size of your frame will ultimately limit the amount of muscle you can pack on. But of course, it takes longer for a much taller person to look dense with muscle, as they require more work to fill that larger space. The tendon insertion is the point where the tendon connects the muscle to the limb. This is a crucial aspect of strength and performance. Consider the biceps brachii. This muscle originates at the scapula, that's right, this muscle can also act on the shoulder joint, and then it spans the elbow joint to insert at the forearm tuberosity of the radius and fascia. Contracting, shortening the bicep brachii, has the action of closing the joint angle of the elbow. Essentially, this means that the elbow joint is the axis or the fulcrum, and the forearm is the lever arm. The closer the insertion is to the hand, the resistance, the shorter the lever arm will be. This then means that it will be easier for you to lift the weight with the same amount of force coming from the bicep. Conversely, the distance between the origin and insertion is going to directly affect the length of the muscle belly, which alters the capacity for growth, as well as the appearance of thickness. Aesthetic features like the gap between your pecs or how low down they sit on your chest are also, unfortunately, predetermined, therefore. This means you cannot simply copy someone else's workout and expect to get the same precise results. Keep in mind, too, that you may have optimal insertions for one muscle, but not another. This is one reason we find ourselves gravitating more or less to certain moves and exercises. If you want to excel in your chosen sport, learning how to play to your own strengths and compensate for your weaknesses is absolutely critical. Here's something amazing. There are multiple muscles in the human body that are only present in a percentage of the population. Incredible, right? For example, the palmaris longus is a thin tendon that attaches to the bottom of the wrist but is missing in 16% of people. There are many more examples and this just goes to show the huge amount of variation in the human race. Is metabolism genetic? This is a big subject to delve into but the simple answer is to an extent. And this is critical. Let's imagine that you take two identical athletes in terms of height and insertions. You give them both the same training program and they work equally hard at it with the same diet and rest protocols. Do they turn out identical? Still no. Why? Because they will vary in terms of plasticity. This is one of the most crucial features that will determine your success in training. Your body is designed to adapt to its environment, which includes habits and goals. But how rapidly the body changes shape in response to that stimulus is what will determine the ultimate outcome. Muscles adapt to the environment through hypertrophy, motor unit recruitment, mitochondrial density and fibre type composition. Changes likewise occur in the tendons, fascia and bones surrounding the muscles. 
Given the same amount of training, two muscles may grow at different rates simply due to variations in specific hormones and chemicals. These hormones are at least partly responsible for what we describe as our metabolism. And that same metabolism is also responsible for how quickly you lose or gain fat. The distribution of fat is also genetically determined, which is why it's almost unanimously agreed that you can't perform spot reduction to remove fat from a certain region. It falls off in a genetically predetermined order. Countless genetic variations will impact on your metabolism, which will directly impact on your energy levels, your weight loss, and even your mood. This is partly what separates the world into hard gainers and the lucky ones. But keep in mind that the whole endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph thing is about as helpful a framework as BMI, which is to say not very. As you've probably grasped at this point, it's a lot more complicated than that. Perhaps the most striking example of a genetic difference affecting metabolism is the extremely small percentage of the population born with mutations causing myostatin deficiencies. Myostatin is a protein produced by the human body that causes the breakdown of skeletal muscle tissue. Variations affecting both copies of the MSTN gene result in some people and animals becoming myostatin deficient. This is one of the closest things to a natural superpower and can result in huge increases in muscle mass, up to a 100% increase, with no serious side effects, although this might increase the likelihood of tendon injuries. This is also why calorie counting won't work for everyone. Not because there is an exception to the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, but rather because we can't accurately know how rapidly the body is burning through those calories. No simple calculation will give you an accurate resting metabolic rate, as it can't account for those hormonal differences. As I often say, you may not have hyper or hypothyroidism, but you might have a tendency more towards one than the other. It doesn't pay to think entirely in binary. Genetic differences in testosterone, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, and even receptors that allow us to respond to those hormones will make some people more responsive to training than others. But again, the metabolism itself can be trained and hacked to an extent. You can keep your metabolism higher by spiking it more frequently with intermittent exercise throughout the day. You can even control your physiology to an extent by changing your state of mind. Different foods, varying amounts of sleep, and even the ambient temperature will likewise impact on your resting metabolic rate. One of the most hotly debated areas of functional training in particular is fibre type composition. As most of you will know, we have three types of muscle fibre, although the distinction isn't quite as clear cut as all that in reality. These are type 1, type 2A and type 2X. Type 1 muscle fibre is slow twitch and is less powerful but highly endurant. Type 2A is faster and stronger but quicker to fatigue. Type 2X is faster still, but also comparatively very rare. Marathon runners have large amounts of slow twitch muscle fibre, which allows them to run long distances without tiring out. High jumpers have lots of faster twitch muscle fibres, which gives them the explosiveness necessary to leap great heights. Bodybuilders need fast twitch in order to build bigger muscles, as this type of fibre is larger. Some people claim that fibre can't be changed on the whole. However, most research suggests that genetics only account for around 50% of variability in the makeup of fibre types on average. So while you might have a bit of a tendency towards either endurance or explosive activities, it's also true that you can train to become better at the other. It has been known for a long time that it's possible to convert type 2A fibres into type 2X and vice versa. However, this is very difficult and the change usually occurs in a downward trajectory, meaning muscle gets less explosive. However, there's now ample evidence to suggest that type 1 can be converted into type 2A and vice versa as well. It's also worth noting that explosiveness and power are not just functions of fibre type. We can become more explosive via neural changes that enhance our rate of force production by allowing for greater rapid recruitment of larger motor units comprised of fast twitch fibre. Likewise, we can increase in max strength by building more muscle, thus making those fast twitch fibres thicker and stronger. The efficiency of movement can also translate to faster and more explosive action. So to contend in hysteresis. It's also possible to make slow twitch fibre behave more like fast twitch and vice versa. So while you might be slow to respond to training, you should keep at it. Place a specific demand on your body long enough, and you will change to some extent. The same is true for cognitive performance, where greater neural plasticity, brain plasticity, will mean your brain changes more quickly in response to training. Thus, they will find learning easier, both in the classroom and when learning motor patterns. A more plastic brain may even see greater recovery from stroke and other catastrophic events. But note that more plasticity does not always mean better. After all, if our brain changed shape in response to everything, then it could pick up bad habits as quickly as good ones. This is complex. There are multiple different forms of brain plasticity that can be measured in distinct ways. 
These range from differences in the number and strength of synapses to variations in dendritic spine formation. Again, you could enjoy optimal performance in some areas while not in others. The good news is that there are mitigating factors and methods you can use to increase your plasticity levels. Seeing as this is something that most people don't train, it's easy to get an advantage here, even if you weren't dealt the best hand in terms of genetics. The best way to enhance plasticity? Keep learning. The more you subject yourself to novel stimuli that requires adaptation, the more you will produce the chemicals to support that change. Getting more sleep also helps plasticity, as does consuming a healthy diet consisting of many plasticity-supporting nutrients. The bottom line is this. While I'm all about telling people that they can be anything they want to be with the right training, the truth is that some people are just born for a specific sport. Stand next to a professional rower, and you'll likely find that they are very tall with long limbs, great muscle endurance, and great lat insertions. At my stocky 5 foot 8 inch frame, I'd be unlikely to ever compete with those guys at that sport, with all the training in the world. But this is a good thing. This is an argument for training cross-modally. As the vast majority of us will never be world champions in any one event, it makes sense to train ourselves to be better at multiple things, to fully express our unique potential. These systems all work together, and so we will gain unique and amazing advantages by simply taking our strengths and maxing them out. It's also an argument for adapting training to your own limitations and not comparing your results to anyone else. We are so entirely unique. And don't be disheartened. While you can't grow taller once your growth plates have closed over, or change your tendon insertions, the real takeaway should just be how truly plastic the human body is, how adaptable. You have countless mechanisms designed to help you adapt to your environment, and this allows for incredible individual expression on top of your unique starting point. The things that people have trained themselves to be able to do in some cases are truly remarkable. Even your genetics can be changed thanks to gene transcription. Training, diet and lifestyle factors won't change the contents of your genetic code, but they can change which genes are active and which are switched off, thereby leading to permanent changes to your anatomy that can even be passed on to your children. Your fate is still very much undecided. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did, then please leave a like and share it around. That helps me out immensely. As many of you know, I have a new print book currently available at Amazon and several other retailers for pre-order. That book is Functional Training and Beyond, which is a detailed look at how functional training can benefit individuals and athletes for better real-world performance and health. I'll put a link to that in the description down below. Of course, you can also still get my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training, right now. That book is currently on discount whilst we're all in lockdown and offers a training program, diet plan and more to help you improve your physical and mental performance. If you want to see more like this, then hit the subscribe button and notification bell to get alerted to future posts. I've got some really exciting stuff on the way, so stay tuned. Stay safe and healthy, everybody, and thank you so much for your support. Bye for now.